Let's talk life expectancy today. I've seen the research that's out there and a variety of studies that have compared the life expectancy of a heterosexual person versus a homosexual person. And in that kind of research, you can imagine that some people tend to pad the numbers a certain way while other people tend to pad the numbers another way. I've looked at a few different sources and I've tried to eliminate any extremes um, and, and I found pretty well a consensus of numbers, but I would, I would compel anyone out there to do their own research on this because I think it's really important to know for ourselves um, just the reality of the situation, what, what the people are saying, what the surveys are saying, and, and what reality is saying of life expectancy for heterosexuals versus homosexuals. And in looking at this research, I found that the average heterosexual male lives between 70 and 75 years. The average homosexual male lives just between 50 and 55 years. Um, heterosexual female, 75 to 85. Homosexual female, 55 to 60. So in, in either case, we see, I, I found this right around, I'd say 16 to 17 year difference between a heterosexual and a homosexual. Like I said, some information will pad numbers one way as opposed to the other, but I found a, a big consensus saying a lot of the same thing. 16 to 17 years in that ballpark uh, that heterosexuals outlive homosexuals. And I had to ask why, why is there a difference? Well, there's, there's at least three things that I have seen that contribute to this. And, and I know there's other things, but the three things I've seen is one is depression. Uh, when it comes to depression, homosexuals experience it so much more than than heterosexuals. Uh, there's a variety of reasons why we know, uh, but it's 68, or I'm sorry, 61% of homosexuals out there have experienced severe depression at least 14 days straight, uh, which is a long time to experience depression, uh, 14 days. 61% of the homosexuals out there have experienced that. 24% of heterosexuals have experienced that. When it comes to contemplating suicide, uh, it's 48% of homosexuals have contemplated suicide. Only 11% of heterosexuals have contemplated suicide. Those who have actually went as far as attempting suicide, it's a whopping 25% of homosexuals have literally attempted suicide. Think about that for a second. One out of four, 25%. That's a, that's, a, that's a tremendous number, if you ask me, people who have actually attempted suicide. Heterosexuals, just 5%. So we see that they experience a lot more depression and inward struggles and things like that than heterosexuals. Uh, but on top of that, there is um, drug use. A homosexual is actually 90% uh, more likely to abuse drugs than a heterosexual person. Uh, disease is another contributing factor. When we look at things like HIV, and we, we step back and we look at, out of everyone who has HIV on the planet, 4% have acquired it through sharing needles, drugs, so on and so forth. 9% through heterosexual activity. Now this surprised me. 82% of those who have HIV have gotten it through male to male homosexual activity. So in other words, gay men uh, make up 82% of all the HIV out there. That's tremendous number. I had to ask myself why. Why do uh, homosexual gay men have more um, likelihood of getting HIV than, than anyone else. Well, there is no denying the fact that when we compare the sexual practices of homosexual male gay, gay men, um, they have more sex partners in their lifetime than anyone else. Gay female, uh, lesbians and, and, and straight females are relatively close in numbers as far as uh, how many sex partners they've had in their life. 
straight men even more, but gay men have so many more sex partners in their lifetime than anyone else, many more times. Uh, many actually reach 500 or more. You have some extreme cases that actually touch 2,000 sex partners in their life. I'm talking different people, uh, but many reach 500. And, and you have to ask yourself, wow, it's, it's totally understandable why HIV is, is dominant with gay men. Um, but what I find really interesting uh, when I talk to a lot of gay men or gay women, any, any, anyone, I, I talk to a lot of people about Jesus and what he asks of us. And I find that many um, will defend their homosexuality by saying, well, Jesus never said anything in the Bible about homosexuality. What I find very interesting is these individuals will go to great lengths and, and very sometimes far-fetched um, reasoning to explain away the multiple times that homosexuality is either called shameful or abomination or those who practice it won't inherit the kingdom of God. But they also tell me this and justify their homosexuality while they're out there accumulating sex partners. They know they're living in such a lustful state. I know it. But they act like Jesus don't see these things. They act like Jesus is just okay with anything and everything. Now, sadly, I contribute a lot of that to the churches many of these folks go to because these churches do not teach or preach repentance. They say Jesus loves you. Jesus cares for you. Jesus died for you. Jesus has a great plan for you. Jesus is going to welcome you into heaven. Yes, that is all true if we go to Jesus in repentance. Sadly, these false teachers, these false prophets, these Jezebel churches, if you will, are encouraging these folks to live their lives however they feel they were born and however they feel is right in their own eyes. And listen, this is what I honestly believe Jesus would have to say to these churches today. In Revelation chapter 2, Jesus talks to the church of Thyatira. Now remember, this is the same meek, mild, loving Jesus who, who just overlooks everything we have to do out there. He says, I have this against you. You tolerate that Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. Now, I want you to take a second and think about that word unwilling. Think about that word. Does it apply to you? Does it apply to your homosexuality? Does it apply to your relaxed morals and to your many sex partners? Are you unwilling to give these things up for Jesus. It's serious. It's serious, friends. So I cast her on a bed of suffering. This is Jesus who said he was the one who cast her on a bed of suffering. And I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. There it is. Repentance. Listen. Jesus called us to so much more. There is such an abundant, beautiful life out there waiting for us. It's amazing. It is totally amazing. Yes, he calls us to repentance. He calls us some hard things. He calls us some things that just don't feel good. I know that from personal experience. I have fallen on my face for years trying to repent and, and find myself going right back. But eventually we can get there. Eventually we can live that victorious life he calls us to in abundant glory for him. I'm so thankful. But if we stay in that rut, if we stay embracing our sin, if we think that we can just accept uh, every false doctrine, every false teacher out there and call it good, if your church is teaching you, oh, it's okay to be gay, even though the Bible says no, it's okay. You're running around with lots of uh, different sex partners, it's okay. Jesus has lots of forgiveness. Come to his table. He'll forgive you. Listen, 
What the Bible says absolutely contradicts what these false prophet Jezebel churches are telling you. Come to him in repentance. It won't be perfect. It won't be easy. It'll probably be messy, but that's okay. Jesus is great at cleaning up our messes. But one thing that he despises, and I will say again, despises, is those who call wicked good. Don't be among that crowd Come away from those churches, accept the call that God has on your life, and and live it out. I promise you, it'll be beautiful. Like I said, you'll have some uphills, you'll have some downhills, you'll have some beautiful green grass pastures to walk through. It's so worth it. It's so worth it. My prayer for you is you reject this life that's full of AIDS, full of drugs, full of depression, and you come to Jesus. He has, oh God, he has such a beautiful life for you. I pray you receive it. I truly hope you receive it. Reject what that Jezebel is telling you and come to God. Listen to his word. I promise you it's beautiful. I promise if you just read the word as a child, Jesus is there. Open arms, ready to receive.